Thank you for listening to this message from Simple Truth Gospel with Kiria, a teaching ministry that teaches the Word of God verse by verse to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today we will study 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you missed any of our previous studies, because we studied the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. If you missed any of our studies, you can always go to our website, kuim.org, or you can go to our SoundCloud or YouTube channel. It is Simple Truth Gospel with Kyria. Before we continue, let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for yet another opportunity to gather to learn and study your word. The overarching principles that are found in your word are life unto us. For Job said, I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Heavenly Father, I am not a teacher. I am just a vessel. I pray that you will teach us today by the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher. That he will open our eyes. He will give us revelation, knowledge, and understanding of the truth of your word. That he will minister to everyone simultaneously. That he will give us the enablement, not only to be hearers, but also doers of your word. But we pray that you will help us to not to heed to doctrines of demons or to be conformed to this word. Rather that you will help us to be transformed by the renewal of our minds through your own word. So that we will be able to prove that which is good, acceptable, and your own perfect will in our lives. Can a man take the glory that belongs to you? No, Lord, no. For you will not share your glory with any man. So because of this, we say, all glory, honor, power, majesty, dominion belongs to you forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. Blessed be the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My good friend, I am so excited today. We will continue our study through the book, the first book of Timothy. We will cover 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's go ahead and start. There is so much to cover today. And I will read verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. For us to understand what we are going to cover today, it is very important that we revisit where we stopped last week. You remember last week we covered 1 Timothy chapter 3, so we're going to revisit the verse 16, which is the last verse there. And... Uh, um, it will help you to understand what we're going to cover today. Remember that the Bible, the chapter and verse divisions of the Bible were not inspired. The Bible is inspired because the Bible tells us that uh, holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Spirit of God. And all spiritual is given by the inspiration of God. And it is uh, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. So we know that the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. But the chapter and the verse divisions were not inspired. Around uh, 1205, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, divided the Bible into chapters. Prior to that time, the books were one single book. The letters were like one single letter. Sometimes they did 
they did not do a very good job in dividing them. You will see uh, at some point they will stop a thought suddenly. And they will continue that thought again in the new chapter. So, whenever you are reading the Bible, understand that uh, when they were written, they were one single book or one single letter. And uh, that will help you. Um, so, remember last week, the last verse we covered. Let me jog your memory and see if you remember. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, uh, and uh, remind you of that. We covered, we said, great is the mystery of godliness. That God became a man. And he says that it was justified in the spirit. Seen by angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the word and was received up again in glory. So this is what we discovered last week. This is the creed of the church. Before we had the Nazim creed. Because it brings out uh, some of the elements of the fundamental principles of the doctrine of Christ. It tells us, it says, uh, great is the mystery of godliness. It tells us that God left his abode in heaven and became a man. And the world took flesh and dwelt among us. He says he died and he was raised up from the dead by the power of the Holy Ghost. He was believed on in the world. And he ascended into heaven. So this is uh, our fundamental principles, the essentials of uh, Christianity. What he's telling us here now is, at the latter end, he says, some false prophets, false teachers, they will come up with different doctrines. Other than what we just read now, and as a result of this, so many people will depart from the faith. And then they will begin to listen to doctrines of demons. Now, what is the latter end he's talking about here? Remember that he is not talking about the last days. He's just talking about the latter ends, which started from the time of Jesus up till this present time. The last days, he will talk about this when we read the second letter to Timothy. He says that people will depart from their faith. The word here is apostasy. It means that uh, 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 to depart uh, or turn away from the known truth because of deception or because of human volition, because of uh, choice. So people will depart from the truth. And now they begin to listen to doctrines of demons. Now what, is the, what, is, what does he mean by doctrines of demons? It means any teaching that contradicts the word of God. You know, human doctrines, human uh, rituals and traditions. Anything that doesn't have a biblical premise or, or basis is the doctrine of the demons. So in the last day, he says that uh, there will be people because of deception that will come from these um, uh, uh, false prophets and teachers. They will turn away from the truth. In verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. It tells us the reason why people will deviate from the truth. The reason is these false prophets and uh, false teachers, 
will come up with their own doctrines. Doctrines that are inspired by demons, heresies. They will teach these heresies from the pulpit. Inside the church. Remember, he's writing to Christians here. So these things will be taught inside the church. And you, if you look around you very closely, you will understand what I'm saying. It's already happening now. When people will teach from the pulpit things that completely contradict the word of God. Now, Satan understands that uh, he doesn't have any more success when he uh, uh, persecutes the church from outside. You can see this in, um, in communist uh, China. Uh, uh, when the Christians were severely persecuted, they went on the ground. And instead of uh, uh, the persecution to extinguish Christianity, he did the opposite. <laughs> he made them stronger <laughs> and he grew even more. So now his MO is this, to persecute the church from inside, from within. So this is the reason why he will uh, 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 inspire so-called uh, prophets and pastors and ministers with the doctrines of demons so that they will preach this inside the church. Remember what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. He talks about, he says, in the last day, he says, false Christ will arise. False prophets will arise. He says they will do signs, wonders, and miracles. And if possible, they will deceive the very elect. That's what Jesus Christ said. And in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 29, Paul says, For I know that after my departure shall grievous woes enter in from among you, not sparing the flock from within. That's where this deception is coming from. From within, not from outside. Now, the question is this. How is Satan able to lay hold of these people? These false prophets and false teachers and many sides that he's using, how is he able to lay hold of them? He tells us here, he says because their conscience are now seared with a hot iron. They are now insensitive to the word of God. Their minds are now callous. Now they have what we call a hard-heartedness. And the question is this, how does someone get to this level in Christianity? Because it is progressive. You don't just wake up one morning and you are at this point. No, it's something that goes, it, it progresses over a period of time. How do people get to this level? It starts by when you, we continuously reject the conviction of our spirits when we miss the mark. Remember the Bible says, if your heart condemns you, it says, God is greater than your heart. He understands everything. So remember, when you miss the mark, there's always a repentance in your heart. It bothered you. It troubled you. You couldn't sleep because you missed the mark. You confessed it to God and you received forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. But then it happens again. And this time around, you don't feel like you fell the first time when you missed the mark. And then it happened again and you let that continue, you let that continue to happen. And uh, at some point, now your heart is seared with a, with a, a hot iron. You become very insensitive now. Now you can sin with impunity. Now you lose the sense of guilt. That's how people get to this level. When they stop being doers of the word of God. So now, even though they are inside the church, they hear the good news every day. But to them, it's nothing anymore. 
the church becomes a place of gathering, social gathering, a place uh, we go and um, we try to uh, show up. Uh, like, you know, when you show up in, at a party or in a, 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 in a place. In verse, um, in verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and uh, prayer. Now he talks about, he gives us uh, examples of the heresies. Which means the things that they will be preaching from the pulpit. The things that they will tell people uh, that will make them turn away from the faith. He gave us just a few examples here. There are so many of them. But first of all, he says, these are the people who will come and they will forbid marriage. <laughs> Even though marriage is an institution established by God. We see this all the way in Genesis. When God says, for this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother and will be joined to his wife and both will become one flesh. And he says, what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. So we see marriage all the way, you know as an institution ordained by God. But this one, they will tell you, they will condemn, and in one way or the other, they will try to uh, uh, forbid you or forbid other people in the church from getting married. You remember uh, uh, what Paul said. He said that it is better to be married than to born with lust. Or with passion. Born with passion. Paul also talked about the gift of singleness. But he says it's a gift. It is a grace. So if you have this grace or the gift of singleness, you will know. It is something that we must not make people do. It can never be by constraint or by pressure. But he has to come with personal choice. Now, there are benefits uh, for singleness. Because Paul also talks about if a man is married, then he, he will take time away to pay attention to his wife. And if a woman is married, he will, she will take time away to pay attention to, his, to her husband. But if one is not married, he says he doesn't have to worry about uh, uh, all these things. And you will have more time to dedicate to the work of God. But uh, in as much as we find benefits in singleness, it must be out of personal choice. We don't pressure anybody to do it. We don't tell people that you must do it this way or the other. Because the reason is this. If it doesn't come out of personal or choice or convictions, then you will have a lot of people who are born in with lust. And it can lead to so many things, so many evils in the society. Now, the next one he talks about here is, uh, he talks about, um, um, Forbidden people from eating food. There are some who will tell you that uh, eating meat is a sin. <laughs> and they will base their claims in the word of God, in the Bible. They will use it as their own uh, backup. They will take you to Leviticus, you know, the dietary laws which God gave to Israel. So they will see, they will tell you, you see here, you see, there are some meats God say that you should not eat. That is true. 
God for, for, forbade Israel from eating some uh, 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 some unclean animals, or we call them non-kosher. This law was given to Israel, not the whole world. For simple reason that uh, uh, eating this kind of animals will pose potential dangers to their health. With the technology that we have today, we know how to cook some of these animals so that it doesn't cause any disease to us. For example, pork. If it's not well cooked, it can cause a trichinosis. And, uh, and, 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 and because of the technology we know, we have now, we, can, we know that we have to cook it well in order to eat without any problem. If you have your reasons for not eating meat or certain food, let those reasons be because of your personal convictions. Maybe you don't like to eat meat or you think that it, will, it, make, it, it makes you gain weight. Or maybe you think that they are not healthy for you. I mean, it's understandable. There's nothing wrong with anyone being a vegetarian. You can be one. As a matter of fact, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So God wants you to take very good care of your own body. But the reason should never be because of uh, religious reasons. Because you think that when someone eats a, a, a certain kind of food or animals that they are committing a sin. No, it should not be that reason at all. Let's see what the Bible says about uh, 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 eating in the New Testament because we just read one now. It says, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. So it tells you the creatures of God are good. He says, when they are presented before you, give thanks to God. And as long as you sanctify it with the word of God and prayer, you are good to go. <laughs> Friends, you can eat as much meat as you want to eat and go straight to heaven. For the simple reason that you are not saved by what you eat. Your salvation is what you receive by faith. Your righteousness is not of your self-righteousness, but it's the righteousness that comes from God by faith. Although you might get there sooner <laughs> if you eat too much of it. So the key to it is to eat in moderation. Jesus Christ said that a uh, it is not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. Rather, it is what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. Because then those things will have originated from your heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So evil, if originated in the heart, will eventually come out of the mouth. And that's what is going to defile somebody. Not what they eat. Because the things which they eat will go into the stomach and then they are cast out. Remember the vision that Peter had on, the, on top of the roof at Joppa. When uh, he went up there to pray and he went into trance. There he saw a, a vision of uh, uh, a different kind of uh, animals, reptiles and birds, unclean. And they were laid down in this sheet by, by its four corners. And the voice said to him, Peter, rise, kill and eat. And he said, God, I have not eaten anything that is unclean. But he was corrected in that vision. For God told him that uh, what I have clean, you shall not call unclean. Even though this, uh, 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 what I just narrated now, is talking about um, the Gentiles coming into the kingdom of God. 
But you can see and learn also what God thinks about his own creation. For everything God created is good. <laughs> and then nothing should be rejected. He says, receive them with thanksgiving. Pray over them. And then enjoy. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Baruch Hashem Hadonai. Thank you, Jesus. There are some, some of these uh, prophets and uh, these um, false teachers that will uh, tell you that a, a Christian can be possessed with demons. And so they will go ahead try to exorcise them, uh, trying to cast out demons from them. But we know that through the knowledge of the word of God that uh, a Christian can never be possessed by demons. It's not possible. I mean, a Christian can be oppressed from outside by demons. The persecution that you and I go through, some of them are works of demons, oppression of demons. A Christian can not be possessed by demons. The Bible tells us that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. So, do you think that the Holy Spirit of God is going to share his abode with a demon? The Bible says the greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So, a Christian can not be possessed by demons. And there are so many other things which they teach. In verse, um, in verse 6, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. So he says that if you teach, if you teach the sound doctrines of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you refute or repudiate these are heresies. You will give the people a solid foundation. A foundation that is based in the word of God. And because they have solid foundation, they will no longer be tossed away by every wind of uh, false teachings and, uh, and prophecies. They can no longer be deceived by these doctrines of demons. So Paul tells Timothy, he said, if you continue to be good minister, if you continue to do these things, to teach them the sound doctrine, you will continue to be that good minister of God. The one who will teach and feed the flock of God with the word of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 7 he says, but reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profit a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that is now is and of what of that which is to come. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. What is he saying here? He says, do not waste your time in, uh, in uh, myths, old wives' fables, silly stories, human doctrines and, uh, and uh, traditions that do not have any Biblical basis or premise. He said, do not waste your time entertaining these stories or these thoughts. Neither do you engage yourself in their practicing of them. Rather, he says, you've got plenty of things to ponder over. Plenty of things to think about. The Bible has 66 books. From Genesis to Revelation. Do you know that if you will start from Genesis. 
and then you read your way to Revelation, you will not have any time to entertain anything that is not sound doctrine of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Rather, you will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You will be able to identify these old wives' fables, these uh, myths, these silly stories. He says, focus on these things. Focus on the word of God. And do not give your attention to all of this stuff that we just mentioned now. Now, he tells us here the comparison between physical exercise and spiritual exercise. He starts with physical exercise, bodily exercise. He, he tells us it's nothing wrong with it. So he's not condemning physical exercise. Rather, he tells us that physical exercise has a temporary benefits. Remember what I said earlier, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So God wants you to take good care of your body. But he doesn't want you to end or stop there or make it your priority over spiritual exercise. For there are people, you know, uh, they, they, they like to go to the gym. <laughs> Some will go like twice a day. <laughs> they like to stand in front of the mirror and then they'll flex their muscles, you know, they look. It's nothing wrong with that, you know. Flex all you want to flex if you got the muscles, you know. <laughs> there are some who are in some kind of diet modification, you know. They want to lose weight, they want to look good, they want to look healthy. Very good. Nothing is wrong with that. But he's telling us, he says, they have only temporary benefits. So he says, don't stop there. I want you to take it one step further. I want you to actually do the combination of both. Physical and spiritual exercise. I mean, there are people who spend so much time in body workouts, physical exercise, but they don't have any time in the word of God. So they starve their spirits every day. They have fed their physical bodies, but they are starving their spirits every single day. He says, that is something even more important. He says, it is the spiritual exercise, which is godliness. What is godliness? Godliness means being more like God, being conformed to the image of God by the power of the Holy Ghost. It is a progress. Something that by the power of the Holy Ghost you will attain gradually. Even though you will never get to the end of it until you leave this word. But it's a process. He says, this spiritual exercise has two benefits. <laughs> he says, there is benefit here while you're on earth. <laughs> What are the benefits of spiritual exercise of being more like God? We attend this through the word of God. That's the way you will achieve it and the power of the Holy Spirit. What are the benefits? Through the word of God, we have wisdom. Wisdom not to make unnecessary mistakes. Friends, we live in a world. Well, we have so many systems going on at the same time. There are people with all kinds of systems, and those systems are there just to rip you off, to get hold of you, and take that which belongs to you. There are people, just one mistake will take them back 20, 30 years. But through the word of God, we have the wisdom not to make unnecessary mistakes. Through the word of God, we have the, that uh, knowledge that uh, Jesus Christ took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So when the enemy attacks your body with symptoms, with a disease, you know that you can reach out and receive healing. Something that Christ already paid for you. Through the knowledge of the word of God, through being like God, more like God, we know that we can put our faith in God to supply all our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. 
through the knowledge of the word of God, we continue to be the light and the salt of this earth. We continue to shine brighter and brighter every day. We continue to be a success in our world, a victor, a champion, more than a conqueror. Through the knowledge of the word of God, we, we know that uh, the trials that come our way will purify us, will make us even stronger and stronger every day. So we don't give up, we don't cry, we don't scream when we, when we encounter them. We know that they are there as a way. God allows them to, to be a way for us to be strengthened. So you see, we got so many benefits of godliness. Now he says, there is another benefit. <laughs> this one is coming after we check out of this place. For to be absent from the body is to be present with the, God, with, with the Lord. So the moment your spirit leaves your body, Oh, you are now in the presence of God. <laughs> the Bible says the eyes have not seen, the ears have not heard, neither has it been revealed to the hearts of men what God promised to those who love him. <laughs> so now, we know that uh, through godliness, we will be in the, in the presence of God someday. In the presence of God, where there will no longer be any trials and tribulations and persecutions, there will no longer be death. Or sorrow. <laughs> you see what I'm saying here? He says, this is the way to go. Do not neglect spiritual exercise. That's what he's talking about here. It's very important. What shall it profit a man who gained the whole world and loses his soul? What shall it profit that man who has uh, all these muscles? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Fun boy, fine man, you know. <laughs> he got all these muscles looking good, you know, with six packs. And then he dies and he goes to hell. No, don't be that one. We are now in verse um, 9. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach. Because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. He's still giving instructions to Timothy. And what is he saying here? He says, because we trust in the living God. Because we want to be conformed to his own image. He says because we want to keep our bodies under and bring our bodies onto subjection. Because we don't want to be conformed to this world, but we, we want to be transformed by the renewal of our minds through the word of God. He says, because we want to crucify the flesh and don't give in to the doctrines of demons. He says, because we, we don't want to be carnally minded, because we know that to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace in Christ Jesus. He says, as, re as a result of this, we go through trials. We go through tribulations. We suffer persecutions. For those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, the Bible tells us. And Jesus says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And as a result of this, we endure. We endure every day. For Paul says, I glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces patience or perseverance. And perseverance will always produce character. For Paul says that I know whom I have believed. 
And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. For the light, our light affliction, which is only but for a moment, but works for us eternal weight of glory. Why we look not at the things that are seen, but the things which are seen. For those things which are not seen, well, those things which are seen, they are temporary. But the things which are not seen, they are eternal. As a result of this, we have confidence, we have boldness. Knowing that we put our trust in the living God, who will never leave us nor forsake us. He continues to say here, he says, Christ is the Savior of the world. Do you know that Jesus Christ is not the Savior of Christians? Not only Christians. He says he is the Savior of the whole world. It's just like the Christians are the only ones who have taken advantage of what is available for everyone in the world. This is why the Bible says he became the propitiation not for our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. He says salvation is now available. Jesus Christ bought the whole field so that he would take out his treasure from it. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed should not perish but have everlasting life. So he loved the whole world, the world of sin. He gave his only begotten son so that anyone who believes should not perish but will have everlasting life. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world. But the problem is this. Not everyone is saved. Jesus Christ tells us that not everyone will be saved. As a matter of fact, he says, narrow. He says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many people will go in that direction. So what are you doing, my friends? Do not let your friends go to hell. You see, if you're born again, good. But don't let yourself be the only one who's going to go and, uh, and spend eternity in heaven. Reach out to your friends. Tell the untold. Be that one who will advance the kingdom of God by your services, which means being personally involved, or by your finances, financing those who teach the word of God, ministers, evangelists, and also by your prayers. The Bible says, he that wins soul is wise, and those that shall turn men to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. Be that one who is concerned about other people coming into the kingdom of God. For the time is very short. And whatever we move, we whatever we want to do, we have to do them very fast. Jesus Christ is coming back very soon, and this is true. Now we are in um we are in verse um In verse 12, I believe, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in the word, in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So what is he saying here? He tells Timothy, um, there are, some who believe that uh, Timothy was in his 30s when uh, uh, Paul wrote him this letter. And uh, if you remember the previous chapters we covered, Paul instructed him to appoint uh, overseers or bishops, to appoint elders, and also appoint uh, deacons. 
And some of these people, I believe, will be in their 50s or in their 60s. So you can imagine of someone in his thirties appointing and overseeing <laughs> someone in their 50s and someone in their 60s. <laughs> so Paul tells Timothy something very important that he will pay very close attention to what he's saying here. He tells Timothy, do not look at your age. For spiritual maturity is not measured based on age. Rather, he tells him the criteria for spiritual maturity. And we're going to go over them one after the other. So to be a mature Christian is not because you are old or because you have gray hair. No! It got nothing to do with your age. It got, some, it got all to do with uh, how much of the word of God you know and how much of what you know that you put into practice. So he tells him the first criteria here is in word. So what comes out of your mouth measures your maturity in Christianity. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to a defying, that he may minister grace to the hearer. Let every word that come out of your mouth be seasoned with salt. With grace, not salt. With grace. James says, in all things we offend. But if any man offends not in what he says, the same is a mature man. So what we say is very, very important. We cannot speak things that contradict the word of God. Now, the second thing he says here is in conduct, which means in what you do. He says, do not be a hypocrite, the one who says another and he does another, but rather be that one who will back up your words by what you do, by your conduct. Because by your conduct, you will win so many people over. For Christ. And the next one he talks about here is love. So we measure Christian maturity by your work of love. Here is not just talking about uh, brotherly love, which is Philadelphia, but he's talking about uh, agape, the love of God. The love that God demonstrated on us while we were yet seen as Christ died for us. This is the kind of love that gives. For God so loved the world that he gave. This is the kind of love that uh, if, you, if you read uh, First Corinthians chapter uh, 13, if you read from verse 4 to verse 8, it gives you a very good definition of this kind of love. It is a, a kind of love that is not puffed up, not jealous, not envy, envious, and is patient, it is kind. It is a kind of love that it doesn't put into account how the, the things that were done to, 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 to her. It is a kind of love that uh, does not rejoice over injustice. But it rejoices when truth is solved. This is the kind of love that endures all things, believes all things, hopes all things. And this is the kind of love that endures forever and ever. This is the kind of love that he's talking about here. And the next thing he talks about in spirit and in faith, which means faithfulness, being able to be trusted. And in purity. So in purity here means someone who does not practice sin. Someone who is very quick to repent. 
who will, who will repent right away and, 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 and confess it to God and receive forgiveness. So he tells Timothy, he says, instead of you looking at your age as a criteria, he says, I want you to look at these things that we just mentioned here now as a criteria for Christian maturity. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse um, 13, I believe. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. <laughs> so in here, he talks about what should be the normal thing in every church. What should be a normal practice for pastors, teachers, overseers? He mentioned three things here. He says, reading of the word of God, exhortation of the word of God, and to doctrine. Another word for doctrine is teaching. That's what he's saying here. And we see this practice. All the way back in Old Testament. You remember when Israel came back from Babylon, from the captivity. Uh, uh, and, they, uh, uh, and Ezra read the word of God to them. The Bible says he read it all day for hours. And then he explained it to them. And they were bitter. They wept when they saw how much they have missed the mark. We see this also in the time of Jesus. When they had synagogues. And uh, the practice uh, in the synagogue is as such. You have um, someone who is uh, the minister. The one who takes care of things, you know, will keep the place clean, arrange things. We have the ruler of the synagogue which is the Alke Synagogos in Greek. Jairus' example is a ruler of the synagogue at Capernaum. We have an attendant, which means someone who will read a, a portion of the scripture. And, uh, and um, he will read that and then he will explain it to the people. But then at the time of Jesus, they read in Hebrew, that's where, how the scripture was written, in Hebrew. But the language of the people then was the language of captivity, Ar Aramaic, Chaldean, Babylonian language. So now they will have somebody who will come and interpret it to the people to understand. And also they have people there, people who will give arms. To the poor after the service so remember the time of jesus when he went into the synagogue on the sabbath day he was attendant that day so he took the scroll and the place he read what isaiah chapter 61 you remember the spirit of god is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor he sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and so on so this is the order. He said in the Old Testament, the time of Jesus, even the time of the apostles. So Paul is saying here, this is the way that is supposed to be done in the church. The pastor, the uh, 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 overseer, should make sure that the word of God is read. We are not talking about reading a book inside the church. We're not talking about politizing in the church. We're not talking about human doctrines and traditions. We're saying reading the word of God. After the word is read, the minister should also exhort the people using what was read. So he tells the people, be a doer. This is what the word of God said. I want you to go ahead and do it. Now, he does not stop there. He goes into the teaching. That's the doctrine part. If he tells somebody to be a doer of the word of God, you got to tell them how to. You're going to explain it to them. 
If you exhort someone, which is another way to say to proclaim, you got to tell them how to do it. So this is the reason why I believe that our expository teaching is very, very imperative in churches. It should not be something that we will go around. It helps the people to understand the word of God. The teaching of the word of God from Genesis to Revelation is very important in every church. It teaches the people the word of God in context so that they do not take it out of context. Whenever you take the word of God out of context, you can make it say anything you want it to say. This is the reason why we have false teachers. They will quote the scriptures and they will make it say anything they want it to say. It also gives the word of God the right emphasis. Remember the Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. You got to teach them for the entrance of his word will give light. His word is always supposed to be the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our own paths. So if you want to keep people growing in their faith, you must teach the word of God to them. In the church, you must. It is a thing that you must do if you want the people to grow in their faith. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse 14. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the elders. So Paul was one of those who laid hands upon Timothy. And when hands were laid upon Timothy, prophecies went out about the gift upon his life. And we see this in um, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. When Paul writes, he says, Stay up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He wants Timothy not to let these gifts go to sleep. He wants him to stir them up. There are some in the church who have left their gifts. Because everyone has his own or her own gift. This is where your grace is found. This is where you will excel. This is a place where you will accomplish the ministry God called you to do. But there are some who will leave these gifts, their own ministry, and they want to enter into another person's ministry. And you will see them make such a braggadocious statements like, uh, if he can do that, I, I can do it. I mean, if he can operate in the healing ministry, I can operate in the healing ministry. You know? God called you to be a minister, a pastor, a teacher of the word of God. And you want to go ahead and uh, go into healing ministry. This is the reason why people will fall flat on their faces. Because they have departed the place of grace. The place of empowerment. The place of enablement. Now they are trading in another man's ministry. What a dangerous ground to tread. So Paul tells Timothy here, he says, focus on that gift which God has given to you and do not let it go to sleep. Put it to work because the spirit of God is there always with you to make it work. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 15, meditate on these things Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. He tells Timothy, he says, continue to be a teacher of sound doctrine. Continue to be a doer of what you teach. He says, by doing this, the progress you will make in your own life and in the lives of other people will be very, very evident. It can be seen. 
and not be hidden. He says, when you do this, not only that you save yourself, you already saved, but rather you will help other people come into the kingdom of God by what you teach and the way you conduct your businesses. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks to everybody the same. So I leave you with these thoughts. As a Christian, what do you do? How do you communicate to people? Through your words and through your mannerisms. Think about it. What is your communication to other people, to, to those who are not born again and those who are born again? How do you communicate to them in words? And also in a, a, a conduct. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I believe in verse 2. For you are our epistles, written in our hearts, read and known by all men. Will you be able to say that for yourself? Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, I've come to the end of today's teaching. If you under the sound of my voice and you are not yet born again or you backslidden, wandered away from Christ, but you want to come back or you want to be born again. Now, there are so many people who understand what it means to be born again. So they hear the word born again, born again, born again. Even some people inside the church, they don't understand what it means to be born again. Now, what, is, what is, does it mean to be born again? To be born again means that uh, you depend on Jesus Christ alone. 100% for your salvation. You believe that he is the son of God. He died for your sins. God raised him up from the dead. And now you ask him to come into your life and be your Lord and your savior. And you begin a personal relationship with him. That's what it means to be born again. And you put aside all your self-righteousness, your self-works and efforts. So if you have not done that, today is another opportunity. Maybe you've been a member of a church for decades, but you've not done this. Today is an opportunity for you to come into the kingdom of God. That is the reason why you're hearing my voice today. And the Bible says, the day you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. This is the time you got to do. You got to act. Do not procrastinate it any longer. For the simple reason that tomorrow is not guaranteed to us. So many people die today. The question is this. Where did they go? For man is a living spirit. What your spirit does is like he leaves the body. That's what we call physical death. But the spirit will continue to live for eternity. Where will the spirit spend that eternity is the question. Only two locations are available according to the Bible. You see, either the person goes up to heaven if they received Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior while they were alive. Understand what I just said, while they were alive. Or they would descend to hell if they rejected Jesus Christ while they were alive. No one can pray you out of hell. And no one can pray you out of heaven. Impossible. This is the reason why you are the only one who's going to make the choice where you're going to spend your eternity. Jesus says, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 22, Behold, I stand at the door, and I knock. Anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, and I will eat with him. He will also eat with me. 
You see, friends, God created you and I as free mortal agents. Means he's giving us the right to make personal choices. And he will respect it to the end. If you decide that you're going to go to hell, God will respect that choice for you. But hell is a real place. Do not look at it as uh, some uh, 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 illusion or imaginary place. It is a real place, the Bible tells us. It's a place of torment, torture, darkness, where people will spend eternity burning in fire and brimstone. What are you going to do today? You've heard his voice. You've heard the gospel now preached to you. Are you going to make that decision that will change everything for you? Jesus Christ wants you to come as you are. When you come, he's going to change you from inside out. That's how, how he does it. He loves you so much to leave you the way you came. But remember he said that uh, if you don't believe that I am he, the Messiah, you will die in your own sin. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father but by me. So if you belong to other religions, there is no way around it. If you want to spend the eternity in heaven with God, you must go through Jesus. You cannot reject Jesus and then have access to God the Father. It's impossible. So think about it. And make this commitment today. You got nothing to lose but hell. <laughs> and you have all things to gain, including heaven. So I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. Pray this prayer, mean it with all your heart. Right now you will be born again. And if you will die, you will spend your eternity in heaven with God. Pray this with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe he is your son, that he died for my sins. And you raise him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life today. Be my Lord and my Savior. By faith now, I believe that I'm born again. I'm a new creation. My sins are washed away. I repent and I turn away from them. Father God, I give you all the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My good friends, welcome into the kingdom of God. I will advise you to look for a very good church where they teach the word of God so that you can grow in your faith. You can be taught the word of God so that Satan don't take advantage of you because it's only by the word of God that you can have spiritual maturity. I want to use this opportunity to thank our partners all over the world. Those that are helping us through their prayers, services, and financial support to reach other people with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ at no cost to them. If you would like to become a partner, please go to our website. It is KUIM.org. Remember, it is only those who hear the word of God and they do the word of God. They are the ones who will reap the benefits of the word of God. Therefore, be a doer, my friends. I pray for you this day. May the Lord bless you and be with you. Oh, may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, sound mind. May he rescue you from trials and tribulations. May he give you the grace to overcome every one of them. May he supply your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Oh, may he always have his angels encamp around about you and deliver you from every destruction. 
May he put your feet upon that rock which is higher than you are. Oh, may he give you the wisdom that can only come from his words. The wisdom not to make mistakes, unnecessary mistakes in your life. May he bless the rest of your week. In the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody say amen. My good friends, regardless of what you are going through, always remember that uh, surely there is an end and your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai, Kandabosku, Tiara, Enemaskura Rafara Masende, Ena Labrado Sekubo Shekupatea. Ina Kondo Blosko Buja Kiti Mosku Parade, Ena Fladeske Nese Lebato. Ina Kunde Masente, Kula Kuste, Ala Pradoste, Fala Masku Pradent. Ele Grandem Chakunche, Kula Kunche, Kalabanche, Tekelenche, Sikelenche, Akalabute, Ila Kradusko Vala Pasku Patont. Thank you for listening to this message from Simple Truth Gospel with Kiria, a teaching ministry that teaches the Word of God verse by verse to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.